This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Cyber Risks is a new addition to the P3 syllabus. It refers, as is shown in this slide, to any risk of financial loss or disruption or damage to the reputation of an organization by some sort of failure of its information technology system. The failure could be deliberate. For example, it could be a disgruntled employee. It could be a rival. It could just be a, a malicious uh, 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 actor of some sort. It could be accidental breaches. Uh, for example, where an employee enters incorrect information. And we've had examples of uh, airlines where uh, intercontinental flights have been on sale for about five dollars until it was found out simply because uh, somebody put in five dollars instead of five hundred dollars and then there are operational causes like uh, machine failure or, or uh, even like uh, a fire breaking out and uh, machinery being destroyed and data and information being lost and with so many uh, organizations uh, using IT and increasingly so many organizations dependent on IT and actually use IT uh, as a, a means of making money and, and serving their customers, uh, cyber risks have become uh, extremely important uh, to tackle. It's worth remembering that uh, IT uh, affects all levels of an organization. At the bottom you have the operational level uh, and if something goes wrong at this level, it could mean that, uh, say, in the warehouse, you simply can't uh, dispatch uh, uh, stock to uh, customers because uh, something has gone wrong in the uh, stock dispatch system or the uh, system which shows people where items can be located within that warehouse. In the middle uh, layer, business management, uh, people might be making incorrect decisions. So if you uh, have, for example, your age receivables ledger uh, uh, analyzed or report analyzed incorrectly, then you will be missing some older receivables which you should be following up. Uh, or if something goes wrong with the inventory system, so that you uh, have incorrect information about how much inventory is in stock, you may be overordering in one hand and you may be running out of the stock in the other hand. And then at the top of the organization, the uh, corporate or strategic level here, uh, this is kind of board level or thereabouts. This is where people are looking uh, ideally five years ahead. They have to make a lot of use of external information. This is where they may be uh, planning for the future. And uh, for example, if those plans were to become public, uh, then this would be very valuable to rivals. Uh, and, and within this idea of cyber security, there's also the uh, idea of industrial espionage of some sort, uh, stealing plans, uh, stealing information about technical breakthroughs and the like. Also, it's important uh, to, uh, almost uh, in, in terms of the technology, uh, to realize that uh, the networks nowadays uh, are normally regarded as existing in layers. So you have, uh, if you like, at the uh, the front of the layer, uh, you have, let me get the pen working, you have at the uh, the front of the layer, you have the, the user, and the user of course watches a screen. Uh, and that's basically the presentation layer. And then uh, you have the, the application layer. So this is really where the, the processing takes place. And then you have a data layer, which I represent by a kind of hard disk like this here, data. And uh, security can be breached at any one of these layers. Uh, you may for example, 
uh, be aware of something which is called phishing. Uh, this is where uh, you think you are talking to your bank, uh, online with your bank. Uh, but in fact, what's happened really at this layer here, uh, a false bank uh, has been put in. It looks like your bank. It's got all the right logos and so on. Uh, but when you enter in your passwords and move money about and so on, it's actually going to an entirely different website. So that's that's obviously vulnerable. At the processing layer, uh, processing layer, for example, uh, uh, um, of accidental damage at the processing layer. Uh, let's say that someone uh, uh, is amending the sales program, legitimately amending the sales program. But at the moment in the UK, the, the value added tax rate is 20% of what we regard as 0.2. What happens if that programmer simply mistyped and put in 0.02. Then every invoice which is created will have the wrong amount of VAT added to it. Uh, and when that's discovered, then the tax authorities will come after you, basically for the missing 18%. Or somebody could could, could change the processing. We, te we tend to think, for example, of fraud, uh, primarily happening by a, a change of data. But in the processing layer, if we think of it as a kind of fraudulent layer, uh, I put in, in the wages salaries program, I put in a, a little extra line of code, and it says, you know, does employee equal XXX? whatever my employee name happens to be. And if we get the answer yes coming out, then you kind of multiply the salary by 10. And if it's the answer no for everybody else, uh, it, it's going to be the normal salary. So some sort of error or corruption or, or fraudulent change uh, at the processing layer uh, can affect matters as well. And this has happened in banks. It's happened in banks when they've tried to put through routine legitimate updates to the processing uh, but there was a flaw in these updates and it meant that the essentially the bank was out of operation for one or two weeks customers couldn't get money from the atms couldn't see how much money they had in their bank accounts couldn't do any sort of transactions whatsoever and then of course you have the the the, the data layer uh, the ways in which that could be corrupted you put in a wrong salary, a wrong price. Uh, within the data layer, you may have the uh, the plans for uh, a new product which you're making. You have lots and lots of information, perhaps about people's credit cards. This can be stolen, this can be changed, whether fraudulently or, or accidentally, in a way it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't want any type of change to happen to either the presentation layer, the application layer, the data uh, tier, unless that change is a correct and legitimate change uh, to have put through. Virtual private networks. Uh, many uh, organizations uh, now use virtual private networks uh, for their employees. Now, it used to be, I suppose, before these were invented, uh, of course, we had networks. Uh, and what that meant was you maybe have uh, 12 machines in your organization and they were all connected by a special bit of cable. And so it was fairly well self-contained. Uh, of course, it would probably then begin uh, accessing the internet when that kind of opened things up to other dangers. Uh, but at least if, you, if I, I was communicating to a colleague, it would go around this kind of special cable uh, and there was relatively little danger of any sorts of uh, infiltration of that system. With virtual private networks, it's a virtual network. Uh, we have the corporate computer at head office, but these users uh, could be working from home. They could be working from uh, a, a customer's office uh, using a laptop uh, and Wi-Fi communications and so on. And basically what we've got in here are the, are the kind of communication systems, you know, the telephone wires and uh, the Wi-Fi and so on. 
And this is great because it, it means uh, no longer are you restricted to having uh, you know, a special bit of wiring connecting all the machines. Uh, these connections can be international. And what they are supposed to do is to give you a private tunnel, almost a private connection to the corporate computer. Of course, it's, uh, it's a very complicated uh, connection. It's liable to go from you know, a telephone system in the United States, across the Atlantic, a telephone system in Europe, maybe several telephone systems in Europe, and eventually the, the, the connections are made. So there's a lot of opportunity within the, the track, if you like, of the data moving backwards and forwards for something to happen that data. What you need in a virtual private network is first of all, access control and authentication. So access control, it can be done by a password. Uh, authentication is how do you know the person who's logged on really is that person? And uh, for example, when I have to log on to my bank, uh, uh, there's a kind of two stage uh, authentication process. I log on using passwords and the like. But then I have a, a little, looks like a little pocket calculator. Uh, I have to generate a, a kind of code. It looks like a random code with that. Uh, and then I have to type that in and they match it in the bank with what that code should be. So basically, uh, the access control on the authentication depends on, first of all, knowing something, my password, and having something, which is this little code generator. Another way in which you could do it you could have a password and then you could have a fingerprints or retina scans, something of that sort. So do you know the person to whom you think you are communicating really is that person or really is that company? There's then uh, confidentiality. How do we know in going from this user who's perhaps in the west coast of America uh, to this corporate computer, uh, which is perhaps in the UK, uh, through those miles and miles and miles and miles of communications uh, and as I say bouncing normally, normally being handed from one uh, circuit to another, how do we know uh, that the information has not been stolen in some way? That we can keep confidential information truly secure? And that's by and large done by encrypting the information so it's jumbled up using a very complicated uh, types of uh, algorithm uh, and only really the, the people at the other end who know the, uh, the, the unlocking key, if you like, uh, can make sense of that. And finally, there is data integrity. Uh, how do we know that the data has not been changed in some way? So we, we've encrypted the data, but what would happen if, if you know, even in its encrypted state the data was changed perhaps accidentally perhaps there was a you know a, a, a static event uh, you know a, a you know a sunspot was erupting or something like that uh, and this interfered with the flow of data and essentially corrupted it and what normally happens to get data integrity is you've got things called check digits uh, so for example uh, if you were trying to uh, you put a, a number through, uh, uh, let's say the number that you wanted to put through was 165. How do we know that 165 is coming out the other end and there's not 164, 166 there? Well, a very simple method of adding a, a, a check digit would be in this one to be adding four. So you've got the number and you've got four as a check digit. These two together come to 169. And of course, 169, you could divide by 13. It'll actually give us 13. So, so what we're saying is any, any information being sent out, if you like, has to be e evenly divisible by 13. And if it doesn't pass that test, something has gone wrong. So if I wanted to send out the number 50, then the check digit would be 2. Because 52, when you divide it by the, you know, 13, I think is going to give 4. 
And again, if if the other N, you know, 51 came out, or 53 came out, or 63 came out, it's not going to work. Now, the actual check digit uh, uh, calculations are more complex than, than that. Uh, but it, that's the essence of it. There's something special about the data that will alert you if it has been changed. Centralized and decentralized data, we need to, to look at the implications there. The top uh, diagram here is, is a, a picture of centralized data. Uh, all the information really is held in this corporate computer. We have a great big you know, disk uh, here. Uh, these people have got a very limited processing uh, at their own computers. Uh, and basically, uh, nearly all of the data is held centrally, and it kind of goes back and forwards there as you need it. Advantages of such a system uh, is that, well, all the data is really only held in one place. Uh, and, and, and we can impose a very kind of strict corporate rule here on what data you, you may allow to go through. And if you're going onto the internet, uh, again, this corporate computer can be set up to uh, perhaps bar certain sites and keep track of what people are, 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 are accessing and so on. The disadvantage of a centralized system uh, is that as more users log on, then more people are using the fixed resource of the corporate computer. It can slow down a little bit. Uh, and of course, if this breaks down, then nobody can work at all. So it's actually quite good from a security point of view, uh, but can be a bit clunky from a user point of view, slowing down. And then you have to say, am I really going to upgrade the, the computer? Six people can use it now. Do I have to kind of double the capacity because in a few years, 12 people need to use it? Uh, so the upgrades can be very kind of ch chunky and expensive. Probably nowadays, uh, a more uh, common way is to have it decentralized. So each user has their own uh, machine uh, and each user will probably be, be holding a lot of their own information. Computer 3 here might be what they call a file server. And that would have a really kind of big disk where a lot of shared uh, information can be held. This means that, that essentially any user can operate really without necessarily being attached to any other computer. They, they, they can operate in a kind of standalone way, which is great because if computer 2 breaks down or goes wrong, there's nothing really there to say that computer 1 can't keep working, computer 4 can't keep working. So there's a kind of safety from an operational point of view. Not all your eggs are on one, one basket. However, the, the problem is now we have data being held all over the place. And instead of just having to take, say, one backup here of important data, you have to make sure that each user is, is routinely and reliably taking backups. And each of these computers will have a, its programs in it. So how do you know, for example, that the Excel program they're all using, how do you know it's the same edition that everybody's bothered updating it? Uh, how do you know that somebody hasn't put on a program which which isn't really approved by the the, the 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 corporate IT department? Whereas here it was much more easy uh, to control it because of the centralized nature of it. So decentralized uh, is is good from almost a user's point of view. You are doing locally. You're not going to be you know, your work. You're not going to be slowed down when other people. Uh, begin working as well. There's a resilience in the system to break down, but it does mean if your data is spread around and your processing is spread around, the risk is spread around as well. Following on from centralized and decentralized, uh, we need to investigate what's meant by the concept of the cloud. Now, the way processing used to happen is you'd have your four users, uh, and each user would have, say, its copy of uh, Word for Windows. Each user would have its uh, 
copy of Excel. And if it was some sort of engineering uh, company, uh, each user would have some kind of copy of its computer-aided design program as well. And every computer had to be capable of using these, let's say, three bits of software. But of course, by and large, any user would only be using one of them at once. You'd be writing your letter, you'd be doing your cash flow, or you'd be designing something in the computer-aided design software. This meant uh, that, uh, although you had four versions of Word there, the, the chances of the, them all being used at the same time is relatively small, which isn't a very good use, maybe, of your investment in that software. It also means, if you look at computer-aided design, computer-aided design has got very high processing requirements to process all of those graphics. So each of these machines had to be quite a quite a powerful machine because from time to time each of them would have to run the computer-aided design software. And again that was wasteful because it might be only a couple of days a week that each of them would be used for computer-aided design. It also had difficulties if uh, the version of software has to change all four users has to update their Word, their Excel, the computer data design, uh, maybe to keep the uh, results of these items of software compatible with each other and, and the like. So we have powerful machines, therefore expensive. We have multiple copies of the software, therefore expensive. Uh, uh, and uh, this is regarded as uh, difficulty with updating, and this is regarded as being a bit wasteful. What's happened uh, now, essentially, in many organizations is that uh, you have a cloud computer or cloud computers probably there. And this is where you have your copy of Word, your copy of Excel, and your copy of the computer-aided design program. And this is where you also keep the data. For most of the time. This means if I want to write a letter here, what I, I actually do, what I actually see in the screen, it looks like Word, but it's, if you like it's just the interface of Word. The actual process is taking place there. If I change to looking at computer-aided design, uh, and then I see the interface of computer-aided design on my screen. I can manipulate it using my mouse and my keyboard, but actually uh, what it's doing is really just passing up and down the results of my mouse clicks and, and the result of what the picture, the diagram looks like, computer-aided design. But all the processing What's only new? The vast bulk of the processing is happening there. These can then be what are called the lean clients. This is normally regarded as a probably called a server, cloud server. And by a lean client, it means they don't have to be very powerful because they're not actually doing the processing, they're just displaying the results and, and acting as the interface. The great thing about this is you really only need one copy of Word, Excel, and computer-aided design. There are licensing implications. Uh, you, you have to buy a, a license to allow maybe four people to use it, but that's cheaper than buying four copies of Word. It means with the addition of Word changes, you just change it in one place in the cloud computer. It means a cloud computer can be powerful. It, it can allow easily maybe one or two people to use a computer-aided design uh, uh, software at the same time, it's powerful enough to do that. The chances of all four people wanting to go onto a, a processing heavy application is very small. So it, it, it comes out to be rather cheaper. The machines are smaller, cheaper, simpler, lean machines as they'll be called. The cloud computer has to be powerful. 
You only have really the one version of each type of software there, easy to update and so on, and people share that. And what happens in more sophisticated uh, uh, systems as well is, for example, if all four people wanted to use the computer-aided design program, it's got here cloud computers. The processing power here uh, it can all often be flexible. It brings online, if you like, or sends work out to another computer. The cloud computers can be in-house, but quite often the cloud computers are actually hosted by third-party organizations like maybe Hewlett-Packard or Microsoft. These, these people can make very, you know, they, they make very large computers. And then basically what they do is they hire out time on that, uh, hire out software on that uh, to many, many, many different firms. The extra risks which come in to this, of course, there is a, a, a problem potentially if your uh, communication uh, breaks down. You have to be careful that the information flowing backwards and forwards is encrypted and so on that we, we have in ordinary networks. And there, there can be some difficulties, if you like, if you're keeping confidential information on a machine which is actually somebody else's property and uh, which is kept somewhere else uh, and you, you're not necessarily sure of what care they take with this data which is very very precious to you. So if you're going to be using cloud computers you need to be absolutely convinced that the data that you are entrusting to be held by a third party is being held securely. Uh, and it's got all the the encryption and access controls that you would expect. Finally, in this uh, part of the um, uh, section, we'll just go down and uh, list off the various operational risks uh, that uh, can apply to IT systems. Uh, physical risks, fire, flood, risk of terrorism, just somebody happening to spilling a cup of a cup of coffee over a machine is an operational risk. Risks to data and systems integrity. So it can be a human error, malicious damage, espionage, industrial action, where people in the IT department uh, you know refuse to uh, load certain pieces of information that you require. Fraud risks very big indeed in uh, IT. Internet risks, uh, where a virus comes into your machine, which is maybe going to uh, stop it operating properly, or, or decides to delete files, or, or nowadays there's something called ransomware, uh, and they say, right, we have um, encrypted your files, uh, pay us a certain amount of money, and we'll unencrypt them for you. That's a specialist sort of a virus or hacking. Hacking getting into somebody else's machine when you shouldn't be there. Maybe just to have a little nosy about, maybe to steal data, maybe to change data. Denial of service is where many, 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 often automated uh, access requests are made to uh, a website, and this overpowers the website, and no legitimate users can then interact with the website. Illegal downloads. Uh, people downloading, uh, say, pornographic uh, material or downloading uh, copies of films which they haven't paid for or music which they haven't paid for or software which they haven't paid for. Data protection risks. Many uh, countries nowadays have quite strict data protection uh, risks to protect individuals. Uh, and if you breach these, you can be liable for considerable uh, uh, fines and legal sanction. Malware. Malware is, is really a, a, almost a, a general uh, term now for a software of some sort which is going to cause damage. Virus is, is, is a form of that. Uh, we talked about um, ransomware is a, a form of malware. Uh, another form is uh, malware which tracks all your internet activities and reports that back to someone that is malware. There have been reports of malware which turn on uh, cameras 
which turn on microphones and so on, and therefore can be used to, to, to spy on what's happening. So it's a very general term is malware. Backdoor. A backdoor is where a programmer uh, has put a kind of secret way in uh, to a program. So if we take the wages and salaries program, you would expect there to be kind of password control uh, uh, before you could change somebody's salary. So somebody in the human resources department would have this special password that allowed salaries to be changed. And you think it's very, very secure. Uh, but then you have your uh, software engineer, the programmer, uh, who still works there. Uh, and this person you know, puts in a, maybe a silly name. Uh, uh, or, or has a you know a special extra reserved password that only that person knows. So so no matter how the legitimate user changes the password, there is still this other password, other secret password that the programmer can use and change their own salaries or their friends' salaries or, or whatever else they want to get up to. And finally, uh, we have systems development risks. This is where you're changing a program. There's not necessarily any um, malice involved in this. It's the example I gave earlier of uh, where a bank was trying to update its routine systems. Uh, an error was in the update and the systems simply didn't work uh, for a couple of weeks.